All right. Um, thank you, Lauren. Um, so welcome to this presentation, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining today. Um, so today I'd like to talk about a project I've been involved in for the past uh, four to five years, um, which is called Intoto. Uh, Intoto is the first framework designed to cryptographically protect the integrity of the software development and distribution supply chain as a whole, and basically to offer end users insights into how a piece of software was produced. Uh, so I think this is very timely, you know, given the uh, very recent uh, solar winds uh, incident, which I'm sure most of you heard about. My name is uh, Reza Kurtmola. I'm a professor of computer science at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And this presentation is joint work with uh, my collaborators from New York University and Purdue University, Justin Capos, Santiago Arias Torres, Lucas Puringer, Hamad Afsali, and Trishan Kupusami. All right, so let's start first by defining what is the software supply chain. So, you know, in case you didn't know, every piece of software you have on your computer was really made through a supply chain. So here is an example of a simple supply chain, right? Uh, you have a server that keeps track of the source code, usually via a version control system. You have a build server um, or a build server farm that's building the source code. And then there's a packaging step that puts together a bunch of resources such as binaries and other metadata, you know, there may be testing. And finally, there is, uh, you know, all of this is put on a distribution repository for end users. Now, it comes to no surprise, um, uh, you know, as no surprise to this audience that attackers may disrupt each and every step of such supply chains. So over the past few years, we have witnessed many such incidents you know, for example, in this uh, in this one, the version control system step was attacked with hackers breaking into the GitHub account of the Gen 2 Linux distribution. Uh, you have the CC cleaner attack where a backdoor was inserted into a build uh, that was downloaded uh, over 2 million times. Uh, you have the Xcode, Xcode ghost uh, in which hackers uh, provided developers with tampered versions of the Xcode development environment. Um, that basically inserts backdoors into an application at compile time. Uh, you have the Kingslayer incident uh, where a uh, Trojan horse was inserted into a tool used by window, uh, Windows system administrators. Uh, the Linux Mint attack, this one um, uh, affects the distribution step where an image was replaced with a backdoor image. And of course, the most recent one where uh, SolarWinds, uh, which is a vendor um, you know, of a popular network management system, was compromised, which resulted in the compromise of many of its clients. All right, so all of these incidents show us that attacks can affect each and every one of the supply chain steps. Uh, and if you look again at this simple uh, uh, chain, you can see that there are close to 10 points where an attack may happen and may have significant impact on the end user. Right, so it turns out that there are also you know, several reports by uh, um, cybersecurity vendors showing that uh, at software supply chain attacks have been on the rise of the, over the past few years. For example, uh, a couple of years ago, a report by Symantec shows a 200% increase over the previous year. And a 2020 SONA type report shows a 400% uh, percent increase over the previous year in this type of attacks. Right, so um, how can we defend against all this? You know, currently, we actually have many good point solutions that protect uh, the individual steps of the chain. You know, for example, uh, for the version control system, right, um, you have some solutions such as uh, git commit signing, uh, right? Uh, and we even have you know, um, some defenses that include our own work uh, on uh, protecting against uh, metadata manipulation attacks in Git. Uh, which, you know, we have a solution a few years ago that was actually incorporated into the Git tag signing model. Uh, and you've, of course, you have all other point solutions that protect other individual steps. For example, the build step, right? You can use something uh, called uh, reproducible builds uh, that can help against the backdooring compilers. Uh, and there are projects such as Notary and TAF that are uh, protecting the packaging and the update steps, for example. However, even with those in step, uh, even with those protections in place, 
It is still possible, turns out, as actually we've seen uh, numerous times over the past few years, it's still possible to tamper, uh, for example, with the chain in between these steps. And there are also many other questions such as, you know, is the security policy being followed? So it turns out that what's missing, uh, you know, from the picture is really a comprehensive framework uh, that attempts to secure, you know, the software supply chain as a whole. And that's where Intoto comes in, right? So, um, uh, we're trying to, within Toto, we'll try, we're trying to really rethink the software supply chain security as a whole. And before delving into the details of Intoto, I have this one slide that uh, will give you an overview about the project's past and where we are at the moment. Uh, so if there's one slide, you know, you should remember from, the, from this presentation, this is it, okay? Uh, now, Intoto comes from Latin, uh, and really uh, in Latin, it stands for on the whole. Right, so this effort really started, uh, you know, about four or five years ago in 2016, um, and the goal uh, of the project is to protect the software supply chain as a whole and to provide insights into how a piece of software has been produced. Uh, initially, this, uh, you know, we had the, the uh, funding from DARPA uh, for this, and we currently have uh, an NSF, uh, uh, you know, grant. Um, uh, funding this project uh, under the, uh, you know, in the SATSI program under the um, um, uh, uh, transition to practice uh, uh, category. All right, so uh, Intoto is basically free for everyone to use, is released, um, uh, you know, as open source software, and it's available at this uh, URL. Uh, we recently, a, a few months ago, we released uh, uh, version 1.0, which basically uh, stands proof, you know, to, to the maturity of the framework. Um, and, you know, at the website, uh, we can find the implementation, uh, the specification, and, uh, you know, things like uh, examples of how to use it with a few, uh, you know, uh, sample uh, supply chains. Uh, it is currently a Linux Foundation project under the uh, Cloud Native uh, Computing, uh, you know, Foundation uh, category, and um, it turns out it's actually used uh, quite a lot uh, in production. It's been uh, integrated into several open source and commercial products, uh, such as uh, uh, in, uh, in the reproducible builds projects, into Git, Docker, Datadog, uh, and other um, uh, Linux distributions such as OpenSUSE. Um, finally, uh, if you want to learn, uh, you know, more technical details about it, we actually published an article uh, about Intoto uh, in uh, Usenix Security 2019, and I refer you to this article, you know, uh, for the uh, gory technical details. All right, so this was Intoto at a glance. Now, um, Intoto was designed based on three major principles. The first one was compromise resilience, right? So we know that attackers will eventually break into systems and want to provide resilience uh, against this based on two techniques, role separation, and also using revocation and key rotation. The second uh, principle is that we want uh, in total to be all encompassing, right? We want to protect uh, you know, the software from the moment when the first line of code was committed all the way to when the end user installs the software on their device. So we achieve this uh, based on two features, uh, being tool agnostic and having the ability to uh, integrate in total seamlessly in any supply chain. Finally, um, our th third uh, principle is that we want the framework in total to be expressive enough so it can be integrated in any supply chain. And I'll talk more about these three uh, properties. All right, so the first one, role separation and compromise resilience, um, Again, the, our toy supply chain example, uh, we have Bob who's um, uh, tagging a Git release. We have Carol who's building. We have Aaron who is packaging everything together. And we have Dave who's testing, right? So we want to be able to deal with compromise. For example, uh, if Dave who's in charge of testing is compromised, uh, we want to be able to take away uh, uh, Dave's key or take away Dave's privileges and replace it really with someone else uh, that we trust to perform the test correctly. Okay. The second principle is um, that of being tool agnostic, right? So various tools can be used in the steps of the chain, right? So for example, here, you know, you may recognize this is uh, the logo for Git as a version control system. But of course, you know, um, other people may use other VCSs such as Mercurial. 
Um, and of course, we want to be able to accommodate that, right? So we want to be tool agnostic. Finally, uh, we want to also want to be uh, all encompassing, right? So um, again, back to the toy software supply chain example, this is maybe how a typical supply chain looks today, but tomorrow or next year, it may be different. You know, maybe tomorrow, um, you know, uh, some researcher uh, comes uh, with uh, maybe a fingerprint reader based authentication system for every single line of code that has been written. And we want in total to be able to, um, to wrap and capture the operations done in that specific step of the supply chain. You know, and there may be other uh, supply chains that uh, steps that are not, you know, today um, common, for example. Right? So we want to be able to accommodate all that. Finally, the third property is about expressiveness. Right, so we want to uh, be able to protect any supply chain in existence. Right, so uh, we see here a few a few examples. I'm not going to go into detail uh, of uh, you know how uh, software may be produced. Right, so uh, we want in, in total to be able to represent any supply chain, and we actually do that in total using a simple domain specific language. All right, so now let's talk a bit more about how we do all of this within Toto. Okay, so within Toto, we actually have three goals in mind. The first one is we want to be able to verifiably define what's need to what needs to happen in the uh, software supply chain, right? So in other words, the ordered sequence of steps of the chain. Second, we want to uh, be able to verifiably define who is allowed to do what in the chain, right? So the actors, the entities who are allowed to uh, do things in the chain. And we want to also provide a tight binding between the steps of the chain, which means to ensure that the links of this chain are connected together properly. Right, so at the end of the day, we really want to give insights uh, to the end user about how the software was produced. And for example, we may want to be able to answer questions such as, uh, has every commit uh, that was review, uh, that was uh, submitted to the repository, uh, so has every uh, commit been reviewed by at least two developers, or has this tool or that tool been used to test the code, you know, for um, uh, bugs and defects, etc. And um, on this slide, um, I give you an overview of how uh, we do all of this, right? So turns out we actually need three roles to do this. We have the project owner, we have functionaries, and of course we have the end user. And here is what each of them does. Uh, the project owner defines the layout, which really describes what's need, what needs to be done uh, in the chain to produce the software. The functionaries are the entities that perform the actual steps uh, in the chain, and they also generate evidence uh, about their actions, right? Um, uh, and we call these links. And at the end, you have the end user who uh, is the one uh, verifying, you know, the final product against uh, the layout and the links generated throughout the various steps, right? So this is at a very high level. And now let's go into a bit more detail. Let's take a closer look at the in total layout. Uh, so the project owner, uh, uh, is the individual or group of individuals who's in charge of defining what needs to be done in order to create the final product. So the owner will create this um, st signed statement, uh, which is the in total layout, uh, which ultimately will allow end users to verify you know, what needs to be done. Right, so the project owner uh, uses a policy language to define the steps of the chain, right? And then the owner also uses the layout to define the actors, right, um, in, the, uh, in the supply chain. Uh, by the way, again, we call these actors functionaries. And these functionaries are the entities uh, who are allowed to perform, uh, you know, operations in the chain, such as driving materials, you know, input to the steps, such as source code, into products. Uh, the output of the steps, for example, binaries, right? So we call input of the steps materials and output of the steps products. So in this example, only Bob can commit to the uh, VCS, the version control system. Carol runs the build server. Erin, uh, sorry, Erin packages the software. 
and Dave tests the software. Now, the layout also describes how artifacts, uh, basically the input and the output of every single step, uh, which by the way, could be source code or binaries or container images or packages, right? So the layout uh, describes how these artifacts actually relate to the actual steps. Right, so uh, also with the layout, we want to be able to uh, describe the rules for these artifacts, which means how the artifacts should be connected to each other, right? Uh, so for example, we want to say something like uh, the output of the version control system should be the same as the input for the build system so that nobody sitting in between these two steps can tamper with the artifacts, okay? Of course, um, you know, when we look at such a layout, we expect all of this to be signed uh, you know, uh, digitally signed by the project owner. Uh, you know, in practice, the project owner could be uh, somebody like a release manager, uh, it could be a security team, or, you know, it could be the owner of an open source project. Right, so now having talked about what needs to happen, the layout, let's talk a bit about uh, how we collect information, you know, about what actually happens. So for in total, we actually have, a, uh, we have built a tool chain that has the ability to wrap any single process or operation and to produce what we call attestations that are signed with the private keys of the functionaries in the supply chain, right? Uh, these signed attestations that we call links, links of the chain, they provide information uh, such as, you know, information about the host, the materials, which are the input to the step, uh, the uh, products, which are the outputs of the steps, you know, uh, and other things uh, like that. Right, so for example, in Toto metadata, in this example could, could be something like, you know, Bob basically says, I committed this to the VCS. Dave uh, can actually attest to the fact that I did test Bob's commit. Carol's uh, build server uh, can attest to the fact that she compiled Bob's commit. And Erin can also attest to the fact that she packaged whatever build uh, Carol made. Okay. Now, given all of this, finally, the end user can verify the integrity of the software supply chain. How? Well, given the end product, the final product, given the signed policy and uh, right, the signed layout, basically, and given the attestations, basically those uh, signed links. Um, this is quite straightforward now uh, because the end user simply checks that all of these attestations really uh, form a graph that matches you know, what has been defined in the layout. And that's it. Okay, so this, this is basically you know, uh, how Intoto works. And um, let me talk a little bit about its, uh, you know, its security. Uh, this is what we assume about the attacker, right? We assume that the attacker can actually compromise any step in the chain. And this means that the attacker can also you know, compromise developer keys or can compel developers uh, into signing things that they may not want, okay? Of course, uh, we have to assume that attackers, you know, that we do have uh, strong uh, you know, uh, cryptographic signing primitives and hash functions that the attackers cannot subvert. All right, and um, so uh, when you look at the sign layout, um, this cannot be changed, right? So the policy cannot be changed because it's signed. So attackers cannot simply define new steps or remove steps or reorder steps in the chain. Um, now let's assume for a second that attackers are not able to compromise functionary keys, right? This means uh, that uh, they will not be able to produce attestations on behalf of the functionaries. And um, finally, we also use a um, hash chain mechanism that links these steps uh, among each other, ensuring that artifacts that are produced and consumed throughout the chain are not tampered with, okay? Now, going back to keep compromise, right? Um, 
basically we assume that attackers can actually compromise keys. And here we have, uh, we, as, we basically in total uh, provides a uh, graceful degradation of security properties when faced to key compromise, right? So first, if an attacker compromises fewer keys than a threshold, uh, this means that basically a functionality is not compromised and we are back to what I just described in the previous slides. However, if an attacker can compromise the keys of a functionary, well, uh, then the impact will really be scoped by in total's domain specific language. What does that mean? This means, for example, when an attacker, for example, creates malicious products, the impact will be limited by the usage of, of such products in subsequent steps of the chain and no longer, no more than that. But here we, we can also, uh, as an uh, uh, additional mechanism to improve the security, we can raise the bar against an attacker uh, if, for example, a role is required to have a higher threshold. For example, uh, we could designate two parties uh, be in charge of signing the tag for each release, which would require the attacker to compromise two keys to successfully subvert that tag um, uh, release step. And finally, um, you know, the, the most um, powerful attack is when uh, there is a compromise of the threshold of keys belonging, belonging to the project owner, which really would allow the attacker to um, simply redefine the layout and they can really do anything. Uh, but really, uh, if you think about this, uh, this is the same as if Intoto wasn't deployed in the first place, right? So uh, we're back to, to, to square, square one. Right, so in that case, of course, we cannot really do anything. Now, um, let me look a little bit at this uh, recent, uh, you know, solar winds attack. Right, so I'm sure uh, this audience, probably all of you, have heard about this recent incident. However, in case you haven't, maybe uh, if you lived under a rock over the last few months, here is the gist of it. The gist of it. Right, so uh, there is this software that was attacked, uh, uh, which was a network management uh, platform uh, called Orion, which is produced by a company called SolarWinds. Right, so Orion is usually employed in large networks to keep track of IT resources, such as servers, workstations, mobiles, and IoT devices. Now, um, the way the attack happened is that the attackers inserted a backdoor in updates to the Orion software Basically, uh, in this way, the attacker was successful, uh, you know, was able to successfully breach several organizations that had used Orion by simply pushing malicious updates to the Orion software. And these organizations include the, you know, uh, FireEye, which is a, you know, cybersecurity product vendor, and even, uh, you know, several US agencies such as, uh, you know, DHS, CISA, and, and a few others. Uh, now, the attack was described as very sophisticated and the attackers went to great lengths to keep it hidden, to keep it stealthy. And indeed, they were able to remain unobserved on the hacked systems for 10 months, which is quite amazing. Uh, now, it turns out that the attackers did not go after the, um, uh, at least based on the, you know, the preliminary analysis that has been conducted, uh, it seems that the attackers did not go really after, you know, changing the source code in the version control system. Instead, they actually infiltrated the build server, uh, right? So they uh, hacked into that. They, inst they installed the malware, uh, oops, that uh, monitored uh, the running processes. And whenever, you know, uh, they detected an active Orion build, process, they would uh, immediately replace a source code file with a malicious version of that file that contained a backdoor. And when the build process ends, they would restore the original source code file so that the malicious version is not visible anymore. Right, so uh, it was quite, quite sophisticated. And so now the question is, you know, if a tool like Intoto was deployed uh, here, would it detect and prevent the attack, right? So uh, we, you know, um, in the past actually few weeks, we've been interviewed by a few uh, media outlets. And, you know, this is a question that came um, every time. And, you know, this is basically what we, we responded, right? So uh, we'll really never uh, know 
uh, the, the, the true answer to this question, of course, because uh, Intoto was not deployed at the time on the system. However, uh, all I can say is that it's very likely that Intoto could have detected the attack, um, for example, by detecting that um, what was provided by the version control server is different than what was used by the build server to produce the build. However, it's also possible that Intoto might have missed it. Uh, it all really depends in some sense of the layout, you know, how the Intoto layout uh, was defined, uh, what data was, uh, was captured and verified, and really how Intoto uh, is used on top of the existing processes in the software development cycle, right? So it, it all depends on that. All right, so that's, that was my uh, assessment of the SolarWinds attack and Intoto. Now, to ground all of this into reality, let me talk a little bit about Intoto integrations. So uh, Intoto today has actually many, many different integrations that protect software supply chains for actually for thousands of companies and millions of users. Uh, in fact, you may even be protected by Intoto and you don't know, uh, it, 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 you don't even know it. Um, so here I list a few, uh, you know, uh, organizations that uh, use directly or indirectly in Toto, and in particular, let me mention a few such integrations. So one of them is this uh, reproducible builds, um, right where we are uh, quite active. Uh, so what is this? Uh, this is an initiative to ensure bit by bit deterministic builds of a source package really to avoid things like backdooring compilers uh, or compromised tool chains in the Debian infrastructure, right? So uh, today, um, I believe uh, pretty much all Debian packages are reproducible, right, bit by bit, meaning, you know, uh, that various institutions run rebuild their infrastructure to rebuild Debian packages independently and to produce in total metadata that allows end users to cryptographically assert you know, whether a package that they want to install has been reproducibly built by a set of K rebuilders, right? So uh, really uh, Intoto was integrated into the app, APT, apt uh, uh, package manager in, uh, in the APT transport protocol, uh, which has an option to use Intoto metadata to verify before installing a package that the package was reproducibly built on multiple systems and that the outputs of those builds are the same. Now, Intoto was also uh, used in the context of, of, uh, of the cloud. Uh, and here, uh, you know, uh, I'm talking about cloud native applications, which are, uh, so cloud native is really used to refer to container-based environments, which are characterized by rapid changes and constant redeployment of the internal components. Uh, these are really distributed systems that are managed by an orchestration system such as Kubernetes. Uh, and are mostly automated using pipeline managers such as Jenkins. Right? So Intoto was actually integrated into KubeSec, so something called KubeSec, which is a Kuber Kubernetes resource and configuration static analyzer. And really there, Intoto is being used to track all the operations within a distributed system and verify the container images before uh, uh, they are being deployed. All right, so now uh, let me also mention perhaps our largest, one of our largest integrations with Datadog, uh, right, uh, which is a publicly uh, traded uh, uh, company. Uh, so really Datadog is a monitoring service for cloud scale applications that provides monitoring of servers, databases, tools, and services through a software as a service data analytics platform. So it's really a data analytics platform and it really supports multiple cloud uh, service providers, including um, uh, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, it actually has over 8,000 clients, among which uh, we can count Twitter, NASDAQ, and the Washington Post. And it really collects trillions of monitoring points per day. Now, uh, the data dog uh, has an agent, right? A piece of software that runs on hosts and collects events and metrics and sends them back to Datadog. Uh, and basically Datadog developers can write plugins that collect data from customer infrastructure. Now Intoto is used here to really guarantee that uh, whatever runs on the customer infrastructure is what Datadog developers wrote. Okay, so again, if uh, for more details, you know about all these integrations, especially the Datadog one, 
um, I uh, point you to the to the article that I mentioned earlier, uh, published in uh, Usenix Security 2019. All right, so um, I think I actually came a little bit. Um, uh, I went a little bit faster than I originally intended, uh, but this is really my last slide. Um, you know, uh, to conclude, um, software supply chains are uh, on the rise and are really here to stay, right? So this problem will only grow uh, in time if left unaddressed. And I have presented in Toto, which is a novel framework uh, to protect the integrity of the software supply chains. Uh, it has some nice properties such as compromised resilience. It is all encompassing and it's expressive, meaning it can be deployed within uh, any supply chain. Uh, it's currently deployed and is protecting thousands of companies and organizations. And we actually have a, a, an entire you know, community working on this. We have over 30 contributors from uh, 10 organizations that include academia, industry, and open source. And we're really hoping uh, Intoto will become, and we're actually act actively working on making Intoto the uh, standard for securing software supply chains. All right, and that's all I had to say. And I think we have a lot of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Reza, we appreciate that. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to again, put those questions in the chat section and we'll have Dr. Carmola respond to those. Are there any other companies doing anything similar to this project, but not open source? Uh, not that we are aware of, right? So like I mentioned, uh, there are uh, point solutions that try to protect individual steps, but we are not aware of any other framework uh, either in the open source or, you know, uh, closed source domain that um, is trying to do something similar, basically uh, looking at the integrity of the supply chain as a whole. All right, so I think that's our only question, Reza. All right, um, and thank you everyone for taking the time to you know uh, to spend with us uh, this Thursday afternoon. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have additional questions, um, I didn't put my email address here, but you know, just Google my name uh, and uh, uh, Google in Toto, and you'll find my contact information. And feel free to email me. All right, perfect. So um, Reza and Dr. Khan, Dr. Kamala and Dr. Khan, thank you again for presenting today. And we wanna thank everyone for participating in our February Tech Talk. Um, be on the lookout for the announcement for our March forum, as well as our March Tech Talks. Um, want to give a thank you to James Stilfa from Capital Technology University, um, Capital Technology University um, for their help in supporting our, tech, our monthly Tech Talks. So um, thanks so much, everyone. Stay warm and stay safe. And again, thank you, Reza and Dr. Khan. Have a great day. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.